you sort of start with a big picture and then you sort of pick what might be the most interesting or probable leads and then you try to study those in detail to get real answers. Welcome to Arthritis Now. Today we're talking to Dr. Michelle Kallenberg from the University of Michigan. She's a rheumatologist as well as an assistant professor of internal medicine. Today we're learning about the correlations between skin and kidney involvement in lupus and how this may lead to future treatments. Can you first tell us about the grant that you received from the Arthritis National Research Foundation and what that did for your research? Sure. So our um, grant that we got was uh, to look at um, how inflammation in the skin can impact the activity of lupus. So we were interested in this problem um, because patients, um, are, many lupus patients are sensitive to the sun and things like UV light can cause their skin to not only get a rash, but sometimes we also see that once they've gotten exposed to the sun that their lupus in their body also becomes very active. And so they can get inflammation in their kidneys or um, in their bloodstream in general or in their joints after they get exposed to the sun. And in mice, it's kind of hard to model that because um, they don't seem to react to the sun quite in the same way as people. And so we chose to look at a different way of looking at skin inflammation in the mice. And it turned out that we were able to see um, by, uh, basically putting a Band-Aid on and taking it off of the mouse and causing like a Band-Aid rash, we could get a very similar flare of lupus like what we see in people. And so we, we studied that with the money from the Arthritis National Research Foundation. So the first year of our funding, we were characterizing um, what exactly is going on in, in the kidney uh, with once we induced skin inflammation. And we chose to look at the kidney because kidney inflammation is the number one cause of death and sort of difficult life circumstances in lupus patients. And so I feel like that's the most important organ to sort of think about in terms of making a difference in, in people's, uh, you know, longevity and, and uh, morbidity from their disease. We looked at the kidney and what we were able to see is that the inflammation in the skin results resulted in buildup of antibodies in the kidney that caused inflammation to start. And we were able to identify and tease out what were the very first inflammatory cells that were coming into the kidney. And that makes them a really good target in terms of uh, trying to figure out how to prevent uh, the kidney disease from getting started. The second year of our Arthritis National Research Foundation funding is actually looking at a specific target uh, that we can block and shut down the inflammation in the kidney after we induce the skin inflammation. And the interesting thing is that this particular target doesn't turn off the skin inflammation, but it blocks the uh, ability of the lupus to get reared up in the kidney. So we're um, in the process of finishing those studies and we'll hopefully have that data analyzed by the end of the summer uh, to put out in a second publication. That's really exciting. So you kind of touched on a lot of my questions there. So um, one question I think just to get started and kind of familiarized with lupus, um, since we haven't gotten to do an episode on it recently, is what is what are the different kinds of lupus and how are people affected differently um, with those different diagnoses? That's a good question. So lupus is a really heterogeneous disease and, and it can affect people in many ways. The American College of Rheumatology has 11 major categories that they include in terms of manifestations that people can get and you need four of them to sort of be diagnosed with lupus. Um, a really prominent uh, feature of lupus is that patients can have skin inflammation, and that skin inflammation is very sensitive to the sun. You know, people can have all types of rashes. They can have sort of very red, uh, what they call the butterfly rash on the face, um, and they can also get really terrible scarring lesions that um, can be on the scalp and their hair will fall out and they get scars on their head or they can get them on their face or other parts of their body. Um, and so they become very sensitive to the sun. And you can imagine, uh, especially if you live in Southern California, uh, how difficult that is to avoid the sun to keep those rashes from coming out. And there's no 
uh, FDA approved therapies that actually are specific for the skin manifestations themselves. Um, so they can be a really difficult part of, of lupus treatment. Um, other ways that lupus affects people, they can get really bad stubborn arthritis. It appears usually like a rheumatoid arthritis where you get inflammation in the hands and the feet, knees, elbows. Patients can also have problems with their bone marrow, so they can get really low white blood cell counts that put them at risk of infection. Also, they can get really low platelets, where, which are responsible for, for starting blood clots, so they can have really a high risk of bleeding. Uh, they can also uh, lose their red blood cells, which are those cells that carry oxygen to our body, and so they be can become very short of breath and very tired from the anemia. Other things, patients can get antibodies that put them at risk for uh, other uh, sort of what we call secondary diseases that are linked with lupus. So you can get uh, clotting antibodies that increase your risk of miscarriage and stroke. Um, and also you can get antibodies that uh, can be passed to uh, a fetus. And so your children can also get lupus manifestation, so it makes pregnancy very difficult. Pregnancy outcomes are, are not so great in lupus patients. They are prone to low birth weight babies, and so they have to be carefully monitored um, when they're pregnant. And the other thing about lupus that isn't necessarily a diagnostic criteria, but has been studied, the risk of heart attacks and cardiovascular disease in lupus patients can be up to 50-fold higher than age-matched control-healthy people. So it's also a really important to manage cholesterol and blood pressure and those things to keep the heart healthy in lupus patients, too. So it sounds like the disease really um, impacts the organs much more so than maybe some other autoimmune diseases do, it, much more systemically, I should say, as opposed to just focusing on any one area. Exactly. Yeah. And that's one of the reasons why I like to, to treat lupus patients, because um, there's so many things that you have to keep an eye on. It really keeps you on your toes as a physician to make sure that these patients are um, really doing well in all areas. That kind of leads into another question I had. So um, you're both a physician and you have a separate PhD. So since you're also a physician and a researcher, how do you think that impacts your research or how you go about both doctoring and being a researcher? Do they influence I the think, two? Yeah, I think um, it's really a unique opportunity and um, the, the impact that my clinical practice has on my research is direct. And so we sort of look at the questions that come up in the clinic and try to figure out how we can study that and provide answers through our research. And I think also our patients get very excited about the research that we're doing. And I have quite a few patients who come in every visit and they're like, what study can I do today? So they're very willing to give skin samples and blood samples to us to study in the lab. And, you know, it's mutually beneficial. The patients feel like they're contributing to, to progress. But I also learn from them about questions that we, you know, things that we aren't good at fixing. How can we, you know, ask questions to try to improve those those particular aspects? So I think going back to your research a little bit and, you know, talking about the organs, I think people often forget that the skin is an organ, you know, and when we're looking at it. And I think that's important to remember when thinking about your research here. Um, so do you have any hunches as to why the kidneys and the skin seem to be so impacted in lupus and those seem to be sort of intertwined? So that's a really interesting question. Um, we have been looking at this uh, through several approaches. One is with the mouse work that has been sponsored by the ANRF. Um, and you know what we have seen there is that the cell populations that seem to be coming into the kidney are very similar to the cell populations that we see in the skin. And there may be common uh, inflammatory factors that are being turned on in both places. And we've also been looking at human data. Um, we've, uh, c we've got some funding through the NIH that we've collected a very large number of lupus skin biopsies and have looked at all of the different genes that are up and down in those lupus skin biopsies. And we've taken um, lupus kidney biopsies through a collaborator of mine, Matthias Kretzler and his, um, uh, and Celine Bertier, and they have taken all of the genes that are up and down in the kidney biopsies, and we're comparing now what is the same and what is different between the things that are 
off in the skin and the things that are off in the kidney. And interestingly, the main pathways that come up uh, in those comparisons in the human data uh, point towards the same cell populations that we're seeing being abnormal in both the skin and the kidney in the mouse. And so, um, you know, this approach of sort of thinking about how the organs are, are impacting each other is leading us to, to the same answer in both the mouse and in the human. And so I feel like uh, we've got to do some more studies to sort of validate those targets, but I think it's really exciting that um, all of the data is sort of pointing in one direction and sort of one particular um, cell population that might be causing the trouble. It's really interesting. It, and it just kind of makes me think to almost fetal development and maybe kind of where certain cells start out and how they develop. And that's just me going <laughs> on a tangent with it, but it's really interesting to me. Um, so you said your team specifically is looking at pathways of, you know, it, it, with your research, it sounds almost like it's a chicken or the egg issue. Is it is it the kidney or the uh, the skin first? So how does your team go about identifying those pathways to study? So we use um, uh, bioinformatics approaches, which means that we use sort of high powered biostatistics to take large data sets and look for things that are either expressed together in the same pattern in multiple um, biopsies. So my collaborations with Dr. Kretzler's lab, um, he's really the expert in that area, but um, uh, we use their resources to sort of look at those things. So those sort of give us clues, but then to really figure out if those pathways are right or not, we sort of have to turn to the human samples and sort of validating things. So we've got um, several projects in the lab where we're actually taking uh, skin cells from patients and growing them in the lab and then looking at the differences between how skin cells behave with like UV light treatment um, compared to controls. And we found some really striking differences between the two. And I've been working with a dermatologist here, Johanga Johnson, to identify some of the very specific things that are off between the two. And we've actually got a, a target um, uh, that um, is very exciting and, and uh, new and would um, be very targetable, I think, because it's unique to the skin populations that make this particular gene. And so, um, you know, those pathways, we, you sort of start with a big picture and then you sort of pick what might be the most interesting or probable leads. And then you try to study those in detail to get, you know, real answers. So would you classify your research as more um, foundational research, you know, trying to understand some of these pathways and how they, they work within lupus? Um, or is there hope for potential treatments down, um, down the line as well? I think it's both. Um, I think, you know, you have to start with the foundational pieces, but part of, you know, the, the draw of me becoming a physician scientist and taking the long training path and, you know, waiting till I was almost 40 to have a real job, part of the lure of that, you know, training pathway is that I have the skill sets to, um, take foundational studies and, and get them translated. And, you know, in our, our rheumatology division here at the University of Michigan, we have lots of tools available to uh, help with those types of clinical studies that are going to translate what we do um, in the basic science realm into helping patients. And so some of the targets that we've identified in these pathways, there's already existing drugs out there that target some of these molecules. And so it wouldn't be a huge leap to take trials into the clinic to see if, for instance, you could block the development of lupus rashes from the sun by giving this medication. So, you know, those those steps are maybe five to 10 years away, but I think they're, you know, within my lifetime, they'll certainly be um, feasible. No, that's really exciting. I, I feel like we're kind of in the golden age of rheumatology research and, you know, what we'll see. I, I think by the end of my lifetime, things will be drastically different, which is really encouraging. So. Absolutely. I know, um, you know, talking about the, the patients that you get to interact with in your clinic and that get to sort of volunteer, you know, themselves to help as well. I know some other patients will hear that and think, how can they get involved um, either with their doctors or locally? Do you have any advice, you know, to patients that, you know, want to, you know, contribute to research somehow? That's a great question. Um, so 
at the University of Michigan, we um, have a lupus program. And so you could uh, just go on our website. You can look for the rheumatology division and there's like links there. But also, um, you know, basically any academic medical center will likely have research programs set up if they have a, you know, fairly large rheumatology program. Um, but also foundations can direct patients to, uh, you know, research opportunities. The, there's local chapters of like the Lupus Foundation. So I would just encourage any who's interested in participating in, in research to either just reach out to a local rheumatologist and they can help you find things. And I'm sure patient blogs uh, also may have a lot of useful information. It's great to hear that you guys, you know, welcome that so much within your rheumatology clinic. We wouldn't be able to do nearly as much if the patients weren't willing to help. I can only do so much with mice, right? But mice aren't people. And to really know sort of what's going on in people. You need to have those human samples to work with. And, you know, I tell my patients all the time, like, this is invaluable. And, and they feel really good about participating, too, because they want to make things better for other people and themselves. I'd like to thank Dr. Kallenberg for joining us today and teaching us about her research in lupus. To stay connected to us, make sure and subscribe to our YouTube channel here and join the conversation on Twitter and Instagram using the hashtag CureArthritis and make sure to get your t-shirt just like mine at CureArthritis.org. We'll see you next month for Arthritis Now.